there's, I, I'd like to, because we are recording this for the community that submitted the questions, I'd like to, you know, say who are the community members that, you know, sent those questions in. Um, and this one is coming from John Song. It says, how important do you think decentralization is for blockchain? And if it is important, if it is important, is pure decentralization uh, or some form of quasi decentralization okay? So, whoever wants to take I that. Hey, can I have one in, guys? Good. We just got started. Okay. No worries. Um, I don't mind starting with yeah. it if you want to build upon it. Yeah. So, I think that decentralization is important from the aspect of um, keeping it available to everybody. When you centralize it, such as, and I'll just use um, IBM for an example, when they're doing a centralized blockchain for a specific customer, people are beholden to IBM to pay them for that technology. No one else can build on it. It's not a shared resource. So that's one of the fascinating things about cryptocurrency to me and blockchain, decentralized blockchain, is that it's an open source where anyone can go and build upon that so you can have your own idea and you can try to implement it um and I, I that's why i like the decentralized aspect of it yeah i agree I, especially i like your point about ibm um just because ibm upgrades their database it doesn't mean that the world's really going to change uh, you can you can look at the examples of digital currency prior to cryptocurrency for example you know of what you're saying uh and you know, I think that the real innovation here is really more of a mining and providing a platform for what you're saying, for people to come together and, and work and collaborate on a project. Josh, you have anything you want to add to that one, or are you done? Uh, one of the things I think is interesting is when you talk about decentralization versus, versus a type of quasi-decentralization, uh, there's different levels of it, and I, I don't necessarily think that, like, for example, there's, there's somewhat of a contentious uh, idea in the Bitcoin community and various Bitcoin forks about, um, is it truly decentralized if everybody can't run their own full node, their own, uh, their own piece of software that downloads the whole blockchain and validates transactions? Um, like I'm a little more on the side that I think for you can still have a, a lot of decentralization and the, the most important property of decentralization, which is that censorship resistance, without like everybody having to run a full node. You know, I think people can still use services like SPV wallets. People can still, you know, as long as we have uh, mining and you know nodes that are geographically spread across and, and have people with different interests in the space, that that's definitely a level that, that is important. I, I'm not a purist on decentralization, but. The ultimate question of decentralization is, is this protocol censorship resistant? Is there any one party that can stop anybody else from transacting on the network and doing what they want to do, you know, as long as it's following the protocol rules? As long as you have that, I think that is the definition of decentralized enough. Um, and this kind of follows in on that. Um, this is from uh, Josiah Spackman. It says, um, what do you feel about paid versus, versus passion roles in the progress of blockchain um, protocols? What's the, what, what's the, you're just saying like, you doing it for free for doing a passion Right, versus? like so a lot of these decentralized, decentralized projects that got a lot of support, um, you know, either programmers or community members that are doing this for free uh, versus those that are being paid. Like how do you feel those two roles affect the development? I think they're all good. I mean, there's always passion projects. I think in the open source community, the development never really stops. It just kind of goes where development is. Um, and that cryptocurrency is, has paid jobs now is great. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that's everyone's goal. <laughs> um, does anybody else want to add on to that? Or feel like I'm no, well, there, I mean, there's a little bit more too with the paid jobs part. I mean, if you look at the people who have actually like gone through a company and then gone out into the space, they tend to stay around and start their own businesses too. So there's a, there's a bootstrapping element to that, going on to do a passion project once you've got some experience. Yeah. And some money. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, in your opinion, what are reliable sources of news, media, programs, or content that you um, would... <coughs> 
suggest that others listen to to learn, um, uh, including schools. So, you know, what, what do you think are good resources for education in this space? If you were to tell someone who goes to um, I can answer that, I guess. Uh, so, I like Coindesk a lot. I think that they're a very good um, resource publication online. Uh, Cointelegraph, I, kinda, I like them as well. Um, obviously, maybe not obviously everyone, but I think that Andreas Antonopoulos on YouTube, we're reading his books, um, very good source of true information, good information, and he makes things understandable. Um, so yeah, I, I think those are probably my, my favorite. I mean, there's an awful lot of sources, I just don't know how accurate things are and how people might interpret things and report it before I've seen a lot of reporting happen before uh, the actual scenario may be played out. Like they're trying to scoop the story just like uh, regular television news networks. So but those, those are my sources. Uh, I think even more importantly than to sit here and tell you what we think is a reliable source of information is just to encourage everyone to, whether it's about cryptocurrency or politics or anything that you're interested in, when you read a source, evaluate what the source's bias is. Um, you know, if you if you have an idea, if you can understand their perspective and where they're coming from, that's really important. I'm personally not really a believer in any sort of objective journalism or objective educator. Like I tell people when I put out tutorials and information, I try to be upfront about where my bias stands on certain topics. And this is particularly important in cryptocurrency because it's a young space and there is a lot of contention and, and fighting and very political debates. So, you know, when you're out there reading information, if you read something that, that seems to be very strong in one direction in a debate, make sure you get the other side of it. Make sure you get uh, some sources that maybe tend to stay a little more neutral. So, I think more than saying, here's one specific person or, or news source that you should go to, it's just uh, training yourself to be aware of media bias and, you know, make intelligent choices about what you consume and what you believe. That's, that's the source that I would use. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like Andreas on top. This is a really great example. His, his master's Bitcoin excellent. book is really good, but it's, it's an engineering level mm -hmm. book. Um, the one thing about cryptocurrency that is maybe unique that other markets or technologies didn't really have in the past is that you can actually go and read the history of it, like the actual creator's history. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, there's a site called the Nakamoto Institute where it's just a an aggregation of all of his posts and contributions, and so you can actually go straight to the horse's mouth and get the information yourself. Um, I think from an engineer's standpoint, it's one of the best things you can do. Um, I just want to ask, before you guys continue, could you speak up some, just because we're having a hard time oh, hearing you, absolutely. and then also especially the uh, microphone. I usually have a yes. really so, big so mouth, so. Uh, yeah, I tend to project to use your outside voice. Sorry, sorry. Your stadium voice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking that, seriously. <laughs> so just to make sure that the uh, microphone can hear. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you, sorry. I try to project, but I think yeah. the, the AC is loud in here and they have this sound deadening <laughs> as well, so. Your stadium voice. <laughs> stadium voice. <laughs> Watch out, here we go. <laughs> um, trying to find a good one. Um, okay. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, ways that we can make deeper level of finance self-sovereignty knowledge mainstream? That is actually a really difficult question. Yeah. I mean, beyond, beyond coming up with uh, new, new programs at your library or doing something for children, uh, I don't know how to get that back into the school systems. I mean, they've eradicated so much of the knowledge that I, mean, I remember learning how to write a check, not that you need a check really anymore, but it was very detailed information when I was in school. So I, I don't know that that's really challenging unless you take it upon yourself to, to, to teach your own children or your grandchildren or, or whatever, but to actually implement it in the school system or that would be very difficult. Yes, that's a tough question. I mean, it's a good one, it but it's a, it's a tough one to answer. I understand. I didn't hear the, what was the question. The question was um, thoughts on ways we can make deeper level of self-sovereignty knowledge mainstream. 
when it comes to finance. Yeah, when it comes to finance, how do you, I mean, that might be one of the biggest challenges if you're your own bank. When we say be your own bank, that scares a lot of people, right? I mean, if someone else is holding it for you, you feel safe. Like there's somebody that we, we've been trained to think that way, but to do it on your own and to, to, to become really in charge of your own assets and, and be able to um, be responsible for that, that probably is just a very scary concept for some people. When I think about cryptocurrencies, I mean, I use the term digital sovereignty a lot, right? The protocol itself with the cryptocurrency, the way that the system is designed, gives people back control of their own money in the digital space. We used to have an economy that was based on cash. You held a, you held a physical asset, you either had it or you didn't, and you gave it to merchants and you got change and that sort of thing. We went to this model where now everybody uses credit and debit cards, which, and, and you know, you have your online banking, but that's all custody, that's all trust. You have somebody else that's holding your money in trust for you, and you just kind of hope that they don't steal it. I mean, the whole system would fall apart if it did, right? With cryptocurrencies, you're your own bank again in the digital world, because you have a software program, you store digital private keys that allow you to have control over your own money that nobody else can touch. You know, but the issue with that is right now is we've gotten so used to this trust-based system over the last many years, and we're also in a very young space where the user experience isn't quite there yet. You know, when I talk to people about Bitcoin, I, I generally stress, I think you should use a wallet where you hold your own keys. But the problem is, is the way the system works right now, there's a lot of foot guns with that. There's a lot of ways to hurt yourself and accidentally lose your money. So one of the things that I generally say when people ask me this type of question about what's the biggest thing that needs to happen for adoption and to help bring this more into the mainstream is it's the user experience part of cryptocurrency. I'm an engineer, I'm a technical person, I love talking about private keys and public keys and hashing algorithms and all of that stuff. Like to me, the internal workings of cryptocurrencies are what make me tick and so fascinated about it. But for the average everyday person, I think that we have to make strides in the protocol and the wallet software and all of those things that allow us to have, uh, that, that allow it to be a lot easier for people to use. I don't, I don't know, so I'm being intentionally vague because I don't know what that looks like yet. I, I don't know what we have to do, but like, when you talk about address strengths and when you talk about backup management and those sort of things, I think those are things that we're gonna have to solve and solve in a way that is decentralized and still maintains that, that financial individual sovereignty, but makes it easier for people to onboard. I think one thing that would help user experience is when if crypto can come out with a monthly statement in the same way that your bank does, you know, to say, okay, here's how much you started with it at the beginning of the month, here's how much you have at the end of the month, and here's what's left over, kind of the same type of conveniences. I think without something like that, the user adoption is going to be lacking. I totally agree with your user experience comment. And also, as like Rebecca and I were talking about earlier, about the idea of a taxable event. Every time you uh, use it, if you want to go buy some coffee or I don't know, concert tickets or whatnot, to have that be a taxable event is going to impede the user experience. I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, so, um, this is an interesting question. So, how can crypto community uh, members slash investors take part in protecting and advancing crypto outside of just awareness? Many aren't technical but want to contribute. So. Just in, in, you know, how how can the general population that aren't technical help build this out? What would be suggestions you would give to the general population? What do they want to build out? Build, just to build the technology out to be more mainstream. Like, what what would you see as some things that just an average person that's that doesn't have your technical brain could do? It is a hard question. I know. I didn't make them up. They sent them to us. <laughs> I mean, I have some thoughts on that. Yeah. You know, I gave kind of a long answer at the last That's one, okay. so I don't want to Jump take, on take the time. <laughs> um, 
I work for one of the largest companies on the planet that is a very, very technical company. I work for Microsoft, for those of you that don't know. Um, we have about 140,000 employees across the globe, and um, I don't know what the exact percentages are, but I can tell you that is not all engineers. Behind every successful technical product is marketers, is designers, is financial people, it's even just executives and administrators that help make you know, the, the community of people tick together as a business. Every project needs contributions from those people. And in fact, again, I talk so much about the user experience and thinking that needs to improve. Like, I'm more of a back-end engineer. Every website I've ever designed looks like shit. I'm terrible at that sort of like, <laughs> really design aesthetic part of things. We need people that are just designers. Uh, even physical designers, when you think about products like hardware wallets. Mm -hmm. You know, we need people that can help people do their crypto taxes. We can, we need people that can help just market these products. I mean, I guess that kind of falls under adoption, but like when you talk about getting a good product out there, marketing is a very actually complex and a very important thing. Um, even a simple one that people say a lot when it comes to open source projects, right? If you have an open source project, you have some documentation for it. We need translators. You know, you maybe have engineers, all the engineers that work on the project speak English and maybe one odd person speaks French, but if you're designing a product to reach a broad community, you need people to translate it to different languages. So I think that anybody can bring their skills to the table. It's just a matter of finding creative ways to apply your skill set to something that you're passionate about. Yeah, I mean, the technology is overdeveloped. I mean, we don't even have an onboarding for the original Bitcoin use case. We're trying to get two or three steps beyond that now and convince people to use decentralized finance. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity and power in things like education and communication. Um, like companies can steer entire coins and narratives using just marketing tactics instead of development tactics and developers or a combination of both. If someone wanted to apply themselves, I think like the biggest opportunities are in learning something and teaching other people right now. It's that easy. It's that young market. And finding out what customers actually want. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, like I guess just to jump in, like uh, I mean, I think it would make sense if people have it, they want to see it develop more. They should use it. You know, yeah. they should actually go and like you know support merchants that actually accept it. Right. Like you know, broaden the community that way. Like that's the most simple way to do that. Mm -hmm. And you know, like just supporting that community and growing it like that is like the easiest way for non technical people. I think. And I think absolutely, add to what you just said, Connor is. Um, one thing that I think is uh, hugely important with some of these projects is if you have the chance to beta test to help them to get in there and kick the tires around and give them feedback. I've beta tested projects before. I'm not ter terribly technical. But that's who they need to beta test. Um, I think that's a huge opportunity we have with this technology at this nascent stage, especially the open source projects, that we actually get to participate in breaking them and, and finding flaws and, um, and, and, and talking specifically to the developers of, of what works and what's easy and what's not. So, you know, if you have the opportunity to beta test a project, I would take it because you get to, you know, you get to see it at the very beginning and you get to have impact on that project. That, actually, that's, that's a very, very good point because I'm thinking of the Litecoin app. Um, a friend of mine, Jim, Jim Flanagan, started building it maybe a year and a half ago, and he got the app on both Google and um, on um, Apple. But I would just sit with him, and he would ask me to troubleshoot it, or a couple of us, you know, try to help him to do it. And if you saw what it looked like when he first put it out versus what it looks like today, it's a completely different animal, and it still needs a lot of work. But he's just done such a tremendous job. Um, gathering information, and that just came from the community helping him. Nobody got paid to do that. It was just out of our own curiosity. That is a huge deal in software engineering in general, not just in crypto. Is the reality is, is although we software engineers are not in any sort of elite group of people, we build software, so we have a very different way of thinking about how we interact with software. Uh, every car mechanic that you'll ever meet will swear at the engineers that design the cars that they work on because the engineers often design things in a way that are pretty efficient on paper for many other reasons but end up being hard to work on because mechanics think very differently about the, these products than the people building the products. 
And so I, I think Laura's point just succinctly is very important that we have people that are willing to interact and sort of test and, and give feedback for these products at, a, at an early level. Like we as the engineers really need that. Where could somebody find some beta testing projects in this space? That's, that's a good question. Honestly, the, the, the projects that I've been involved with, with beta testing, or um, actually found them on either friends of mine were building projects out, or I was on Twitter and was, you know, watching conversations of new projects coming out, and they'll ask, like, I know Digibyte will, will call out to the community and say, you know, we're about to do this, does anybody else want to do the test flight for it? You know, so just, I mean, I know it's not, you know, crypto Twitter's a special kind of animal, but you really do. Uh, that is where a lot of the, the, especially the open source communities are, you know, broadcasting out what they need from the general population. So, you know, I would say keep your eye out there or put out there, say, hey, hey I, I have some knowledge. If you're beta testing something, you want me to kick the tires, you know, DM me. I'm happy to help you. You can get paid too. Uh, there's a project called Get Coins in Ethereum. Well, not an Ethereum project, but it's built on Ethereum. You think it's called Get Coins? Get G I T. G I T C O I N S. Yeah, it's not an actual coin, uh, but it's a bounty program. Okay. And so, uh, GitHub is a developer's tool or a developer's website. And if there's issues or if there's anything that is outstanding, like a bug report or something like that, they can put a bounty on that, and you can like, basically autonomous. This autonomous collective can develop, test, code, whatever you want. Okay. They pay uh, ETH, I believe. Everybody got that one down? Okay, so this one is kind of, this is kind of a big one. Um, what do you think the main hurdles for the crypto industry are, and um, what, do you, what do you think is currently hurting the industry the most? It's kind of big, that's a big question. It's a huge question. So I guess I, I guess so. I like part of my background. I worked at a company called BitPay, which it was a payment processor, and I can't speak directly to what what they're doing. But customer service is a huge deal because you are releasing a product to people. Where we talked about sovereignty and being your own bank, but you're also selling them a product. Is it them being a sovereign and being their own bank? And then when it comes time to provide customer support, what do you do? You know, if you have to troubleshoot something, but they have their keys. And, the system is designed so that they're sovereign and you can't get into their wallet and debug things. You know, where does security and customer service lie? Because these two things are at odds when you're dealing with sovereign, like be your own bank customers. That to me is a huge problem. Um, like we could still just be working on Bitcoin 1.0 and that would still be a huge problem for everyone. Any thoughts? I mean, it, I think we touched upon some of the issues earlier where you have to have things that are user friendly. You have to have something that, I mean, a five year old could pick up and understand, for, and so could a, a 50 year old person pick up and understand. Um, I mean, I don't know if any of you have used um, MetaMask on your computer. I mean, when I first saw that, I was like, what the heck is this? It took me a long time to understand what it was doing, why it was doing it, how it was all pieced together. I just happened to be curious enough that I spent the time to do it. But um, a lot of people will go, I don't understand this, give me something easier. So I think there's a lot that we need to do to make things much easier for the general public. Um, do you have a ledger or a treasure where you keep your, but I mean, if you've seen the ledger, it's like a little, plastic stick, you know, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't look very safe, it doesn't, and the, and the first time I used that, I had to go out and get the Chrome extension and put that on the computer, now they have Ledger Live, it's a little bit easier, but then you get the update and you start to freak out because you don't know if it's going to wipe out all your coins, it's scary, <laughs> so I do think that there needs to be a lot more uh, user-friendly products, more marketing, more, um, just, just much more so that the general public can get into it and understand it, not be afraid of it. I would also add on that where the ability for people to protect them against themselves, for example, like with the ledger, <laughs> and they get to know how much bigger than a thumb drive, right. and, and that's very easy to lose. Imagine if you have 50,000, 100,000 or more dollars on <laughs> that, like you might in a bank, like an investment or something like that, and now all of a sudden it's on your little 
uh, cold storage wallet, and all of a sudden that gets lost somewhere. Then as long you as you have your key, well, maybe, maybe, maybe still, okay. Yeah, but I'm, still, you know, it's scary. Or let's say, heaven forbid, something happened to you, to the owner, and then no one else knows what those keys are. That's right. You know, you, you know it's easy if you were the bank or whatnot. You know, you can, let's say, get an escape plan, you can pass that down to the next generation. What happens if even they know that you have it, but they don't know where the keys are? Right. Then what do you do? Then all of a sudden that's gone. Right. So, this was like, protect people against this was themselves. Exactly, that was, this was exactly a conversation we were having earlier, is that, yeah. you know, being early into this industry and into this technology is exciting, but if you're using it as an investment, uh, a new asset class for yourself, and you're so early and all of your family and friends are not, then, yeah, that's uh, something to really think about as far as how to protect those assets if something should happen to you. Yeah. So um, that's, a, that's a big problem. Uh, since we're on that, I just want to recommend a resource. Um, Pamela Morgan is a lawyer uh, who taught at the Blockchain Trading Conference I was at and teaching with as well. Um, she has a book out called Crypto Asset Inheritance Planning, and she specializes in creating an estate plan with your crypto assets. So I won't. I'm not going to go into everything she recommends or at next. You said her name is Pamela. Morgan. Pamela Morgan, and she is on Twitter as well. The book is Crypto Asset Inheritance Planning, and uh, I I read it. I got a copy when I was there. It's a you know I'm not going to speak for her book, but I, I think it's a very good and thorough resource on that. I think you know, there's sort of uh, like strengths and weaknesses. You know, we can talk about like the extol virtues of like sovereignty and cryptocurrency and the weak strengths and weaknesses of that. But if you want to sort of compare them one to one, everyone's familiar with the term smart contracts. Okay, so um, smart contracts execute the same way every single time, uh, but that's sort of limiting too. In this exact example, uh, you can think of the bank or the trust organization as sort of like an analog smart contract, whereas as opposed to a digital smart contract, the rules are very different for each of them for the reasons that we're sort of describing now. They can change the rules, the digital contract can't. Um, okay, so we're getting, kind of getting down to the end because a lot of these, uh, I don't want to make you have to kind of reiterate. Um, Okay, I'll end with this question before we open it up to you guys with your general questions based on what we've talked about tonight, but what should the goal of monthly meetups for the community <laughs> be? What, what, do you think the, what do you think the main goals for, for monthly community meetups should be? I can start or does it matter? You're the best one. Well, I'm not necessarily <laughs> the best one. I mean, I know when Laura and I started this, I had these big plans that we're going to have hundreds of people and you know it's going to be this amazing thing and, and honestly what is this our fifth one i think it is i think it's been pretty amazing for five times i mean we definitely have had really good speakers we've had good information we have good people that come that are working on their own projects that we've talked to um i think my goal now is really just to foster the people that are really interested and that can make it and even if you know, when seven or eight people come, if they're interested in what you're talking about and and you can, I can learn something from you and you can learn something from me, that's my goal for the meetup. I want to bring you a wide variety of information. Laura and I, just every time we talk, we just write things down. Like, oh, we're going to do this the next time. You know, I mean, there's just, we have so many ideas. Um, the one thing I think though is it's a group, and I've said this a couple of times, we should interact, let us know what time you want this to happen or what day works for you, or tell us what you're working on. Do you want to have 15 minutes to come up and chat about a project? Like I, I wanna hear what everybody else is doing too, because that's how I learn be, uh, from, from just talking to Josh or, or you know, anyone. That's how, I, that's how I gather information. And I think a lot of people do some fascinating things. I mean, Connor told me a lot of stuff about what he had done. And um, I, we had dinner the one time together. And it's just really cool. And I mean, it's really neat to get to know what each of you do in this space or what your goal is or, or what your interest, where your interests lie. So my goal is just to keep learning and, and presenting information. I think you said very, very well. Um, 
what the goals should be. I think that the number one goal of a meetup like this should just be to foster a friendly and open community. Um, what I get when I come here in the, the five meetups we have is I feel like I'm getting a, like, a nice warm hug. <laughs> like, you get to meet interesting people, you get to learn about new things, people running Bitcoin ATMs, you get to learn about people trying to apply blockchain to the law. I mean, you could have a meetup where it's like, we're gonna talk about the future of one asset, like we're gonna be the Bitcoin meetup. We're gonna have an, an investment meetup where we speculate on price. We're gonna have an engineer's meetup. I mean, that's cool and all, there might be a place for that. But I think the best thing that I've gotten out of this community is the community itself. It's just meeting people, networking, bouncing ideas around. That's what you need. Yeah, I agree, it's the opposite of Reddit. <laughs> it's the opposite of crypto Twitter. Yeah, um, I mean, um, I don't know if you have this. And I, I would just like to add to that too, um, you know, if you can just create a space where people can come, it's amazing um, the talent that happens. I mean, Josh and Alex, you know, we didn't we didn't know them before we created a space, and we met a new uh, a new security expert that's also in town that will be coming probably in February. Uh, just because he was like, you guys are having something in Pittsburgh? And I was like, yeah, I looked at the background, I'm like, you want to come present to us? <laughs> you know, so, and, and people want to educate others on what they know. And just having a space, just a simple room that you welcome them in to educate other people, for me, uh, it is, it's just fostering a learning environment. And I love having people who are willing to drive down from Canada in a snowstorm, or you know, New Jersey, or teleconference in from New Zealand. Those are fantastic, but what I really, one of my passions about local meetups is building the local communities. Um, and, and letting those people like Alex and Josh that are building their, and, and Connor, that are building their own, um, they're building their own projects here in Pittsburgh, to create a space where they can come educate people on that and learn from what other people are doing and grow that whole network within our own community. Is there any type of incubator like Alpha Lab does for small businesses? So like a crypto incubator? I'm, I'm, I'm in Alpha Lab right now. Oh, okay. For so crypto. is there a crypto involved with that? Or? Yeah, uh, so okay. it is a crypto startup. I can talk a little bit afterwards, but it was really more exploratory, like, like Here's an idea in the crypto space with crypto assets, doing something with cryptocurrency. Is there a customer for it? Can it does this fit into a traditional business model? And if all the resources of Alpha Lab is, is around, like, can we actually make something of it? Um, I'd say probably more than like two or five years ago, yes. Um, but in terms of like actually answering your question, there's, there's really no blockchain or crypto specific incubators or start accelerator. Is anybody aware of any type of uh, space, let's say, outside of Pittsburgh that has done exceptionally well? Perhaps we could take some best practices from what they're doing and apply that here? Atlanta, I know, has done a fantastic job in their community. They have a very active community. Um, they don't have just, they have several meetups there um, that they also, they work together within those meetups to you know, create a local, uh, Atlantic Blockchain Week, yep. Atlantic Blockchain Week, um, and so they've done, I think, a fabulous job of, uh, you know, creating a, a, a blockchain hub uh, locally and then bringing others in and building that out. Then along those same lines, just as uh, each city or area is known for its either food or <laughs> tech, like the basement, you think Silicon Valley, you think dollars in tech. Outside of Silicon Valley, are there other areas uh, throughout the country that are kind of like crypto hotbeds that anybody's aware of? The only one that I'm aware of is, I think we talked about this one other meetup um, in Ports Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So the community itself is extremely crypto friendly. Uh, there's a store dedicated that people open that just is about the education and, and how to buy it and they'll teach everybody how to um, anybody that comes in that wants to, to learn about it and then I think and, and this is a small town it's a really cute town if you ever have a chance to go there 
Um, but there's probably 30 businesses in a walking distance of, uh, that, that take all sorts of cryptocurrencies and the ATMs are there and you know, so I know that there are places like that. That's the only one that I'm um, super aware of. Uh, they actually, if you go on the internet, you can pull off a walking tour, you know, they have like their own brochure that they came up with. So I'm sure there are other places. Um, probably San Francisco has something, maybe New York. I don't know, maybe not New York City. But yeah, you know the thing about Portsmouth is they they call themselves the most crypto friendly city in the world, um, and or in the U.S. maybe. <laughs> and um, but one of the reasons why is their mayor is very very supportive of technology. So I think if you can get the local governments involved in that, um, it, it's a different level of resources to the community to get them also in, involved create a friendly environment and um, get them educated. So I would say for any community that's looking to, to build out, um, it really, you know, getting local, we've reached out to local government. Rebecca's amazing, you know, trying to get local government involved in, and just listening uh, to the conversation. I think that's key to, to really creating um, a strong community. The community members themselves are great. But we really need the policymakers to be uh, deeply involved in order for it to be a sustainable growth model, I think, for long term sustainability. Well, Joe and I were talking earlier, too, about um, the state of Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you're interested, keep an eye on Wyoming because they have all these blockchain laws that have passed, and um, they want to be the Silicon Valley of crypto of blockchain. Sorry, the cryptocurrency, but um, of blockchain. So I, I would watch, I would watch Wyoming and see what happens over the next few years. It's weird. This sort of like, like, is there a place where the autonomous collective gathers? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually, I see the. It doesn't answer your question, but I see the biggest hubs in South America. In some of the best cryptocurrency developers I've met come from South America. I think it might. It's this completely me guessing is because they're sort of the front line for terrible currencies. So it's kind of what I was thinking where it seems like countries whose economies are at risk right now, they have pretty much nothing to lose with what they have now. Yes. And it almost seems like here in the US where we've got a stable currency and it yes. doesn't take any effort at all to pull out your wallet and use cash or to use a, some type of plastic. You don't even think about it. Whereas in other countries where they have to have a whole stack of currency to buy a loaf of bread. Yeah. So I can totally see why they have the best intention to make it work. Like, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, um, Andreas Antonopoulos talks a lot about what he calls the other six billion, yeah. essentially. It, it's, you know, we are very lucky. We're, we're the, the privileged and the wealthy few that this cryptocurrency thing is really cool and really important. Uh, but it's still somewhat of a novelty for us. Because we're like, oh, cool, you know, digital sovereignty with money. You can be your own bank and, like, you can buy things and it's more secure. And all the things that make it great I find fascinating as, you know, as a, as a, a lucky, fortunate American. But I don't really have to use it. It's super easy for me to walk down to the bank, get a checking account. Um, I can install Venmo, PayPal, you know, all of these cash transfer apps for, you know, doing sort of peer-to-peer -peer money transfer, um, even though it's not peer-to-peer. -peer. It's easy, right? But for people in a lot of spaces, they don't have banking infrastructure. Like they may never even know banking because of cryptocurrency, where they get to be their own bank and they get the ease of transferring money in a peer-to-peer -peer way. Um, they are in economies where their fiat currencies are so debased and not valuable that they get they get some serious use and, and uh, some serious importance out of having a currency that is sort of in the opposite direction, generally deflationary in the long term. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. Do you think that this crypto could kind of backfire or get caught up? For example, like the, the nations that had the vested interest in needing this now, they that all of a sudden uh, perfect this. And then more established economies that are used to what they have, the status quo, all of a sudden they kind of get Behind. I kind of think of like yeah. uh, Japan pre and post, you know, the, like the Atom Bomb or whatnot, where that whole economy was destroyed and then they rebuilt themselves and now 
that's the same area that has now looked at innovation. They have a clean slate. They have nothing to lose because they have nothing. Yeah, there was a really cool article a few years ago, and we joked about this uh, while I was working at DidPick. It was like, what's going to take for a nation state to actually recognize this and take it seriously? Well, probably when a third or second world country becomes a first world country because they seize crypto. And then not too long after that, I think it was Bulgaria had a news article, they paid off two thirds of their national debt because they had arrested someone and seized their crypto assets. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, there was some, some like non-trivial portion of their national debt. And so I agree with these things. Like, um, um, there was a really good point made about like, it's really not innovation for us yet. It's really not, but we're the ones sort of playing with it and trying to figure out use cases for it. But that's the thing, like, I don't know that we're really the customer right now. Like five, six years ago when I was the crazy BitPy Bitcoin guy, I would tell people, like, it's not really that Bitcoin is so good, it's that everything else is so bad. And that's why I was interested. I looked at it like a life raft, because I had gone from military student loans, housing crisis, to then financial crisis, and I was ready. I was like, just take all my money. Like, I'm, I'm done with this. Uh, so I think it's, it, we have, I think, like, taking a serious look at who the real customers are and how this benefits people who are not speculating on prices is probably the right way for them. And, and there's still uses for us too, right? And, and I'll be short because I want to get to your question as well. But like, when, when I think about just the, the frictionless nature of doing payments with cryptocurrencies and actually being set with history on a blockchain, you know, I have a, a vehicle loan with a different bank than I normally bank with. So in order for me to make my, my payment on that loan, I have to do an ACH transfer from my normal bank to the other bank, wait for that to settle, and then make the payment from the other account, wait for the payment to settle, and the whole process of me, for me getting my paycheck and doing my budget and you know making this payment on the loan actually takes five or six days to settle. And for somebody that's super interested and knows a lot about cryptocurrency, it's insanely frustrating because I'm like, if you adopted this technology and the power of you know, using a, a blockchain-based currency, this could all be settled in 10 minutes, in half an hour, it wouldn't take this. There's use cases out there, we're just kind of spoiled and we're not really looking for them yet. And your question? You know, I want to take this conversation into a little bit of a different direction. Okay. Sweet. What drew me to this group is the word blockchain. And crypto and blockchain are two different things. And so my question is, like, I've always heard that the blockchain is a ledger, and things are stored on that ledger, and they're put in blocks. How do I look in those blocks to see what's stored? I have never been to a conversation where understood how does one look into a block sure. and see what's stored on that ledger. Okay, like, like, just like reading it from disk ones and zeros? Like what? Reading it from the hard drive, like ones and zeros, reading off the... Like, like if something, if they say, uh, you know, property title can be stored on the blockchain. Yes. If that's true, which I'm sure it is, mm -hmm. how do you look at that? This is where it writes it's, full node comes in. But I don't want to cut you off. If you run a full node, you have a full copy of that data. And then it's on your computer and you can, bear, you can look at it. You can look at it, yeah. Okay. Now another thing in terms of even a more user-friendly solution, right? If you're just talking about being able to just look at data on the blockchain, um, every blockchain out there, every major blockchain has uh, a, these uh, like an really great resources. resources online or products online that are called block explorers. Yeah. Uh, for example, if I have a, a wallet that's maybe offline, like I generate an address and I send money to it, I can check on my balance that I've sent to that address by using a block explorer. But again, that's crypto. Right. Well, that's that's a blockchain, though. It's it's backed. I mean, you those cryptocurrencies are backed by a blockchain. So you were you were talking about how hard, how difficult it is to make simple car payments and waiting till ACH is clear and so on and so forth. So the blockchain is very good at taking out that middleman, right? So cryptocurrency is. Sorry. Cryptocurrency is very good at taking out that middleman. Blockchain does not have that. Right. Case. So blockchain in general can be good at taking out the middleman, correct? No. So if you have a, a stock uh, exchange or if you have uh, uh, anybody that is an intermediary that makes their service centralized, doesn't the blockchain 
take that centralization out of the equation? Not at all. Because the blockchain is there for the miners. The blockchain is a tool used by the miners. The miners get to decide what data goes in a block. And the, the blockchain is just an organizing tool that is used by other miners to verify the data that miners are putting in the block. That's, all, that's the only role that blockchain plays in, in this technology. So if I want to sell a stock right now, I have to call up my broker yes. who will put that sell order out. It takes two or three days for that to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and then it gets sold. Let's say I want to sell you two shares of the stock that I have okay. directly. Yes. And I do that on the, on the uh, blockchain. How would you do that on the peer to peer? Well, that's that's the kind of stuff I want to understand. Is that possible? Because that's my understanding. Okay. Where peer to peer means me and you, we're going to do this together, right? Yes. How, how if if it's stored on the blockchain, then I can do it peer to peer. Am I misunderstanding it? No, peer to peer and blockchain are separate technologies. Say it again. Peer to peer and blockchain are separate technologies. So, so if I can, yeah, I, go I, I have some thoughts on this. I think might be might be valuable to answer your question. Blockchain and the idea of cryptocurrencies are not necessarily as inseparable as people want to make them. What a blockchain is fundamentally, and I'm going to try to like answer this concisely without going into too many things, but it, it, it's a complex topic. What a blockchain is is it's it's a type of distributed database. You've probably used a database software before day-to-day -day life, right? Maybe you've tinkered with at Microsoft Access. Um, surely services that you use are backed by MySQL or MongoDB. These are ways of storing data. A blockchain is a very particular way of storing data um, that uses cryptography that makes it so that uh, there's a certain rule set that you follow that anybody can see that the data has not been tampered with. So blocks are linked together using cryptography. But the thing is, this is it's a mechanism for what we call in, in cryptocurrency distributed consensus. The reason that blockchain is such an important part of these peer-to-peer -peer systems is it allows you to verify who's being truthful and who's not without having to have an intermediary like a bank or the New York Stock Exchange be sort of the arbiter of truth. So but there has to be this sort of system of incentives around that. So he's talking about miners, right? Yeah, miners are the ones that are doing what you're kind of talking about. Blockchain is just a way for miners to identify changes in data very quickly. So if I'm, if I'm a miner and I have a thousand or a million transactions, a million, maybe your stock transfer is one of these transactions, uh, I'm, I will decide the order of what transactions go into a block and then I'll mine on top of that block data. And then once I say I successfully mine a block, I'll then share that information with everyone else. If that data gets shared with someone and there's a discrepancy, that's when blockchain comes into play. That's when people are gonna go, okay, we can use blockchain to get to the, the transaction that is different without having to check all one million transactions. That's really the only role that blockchain plays in cryptocurrency and the only thing that it does. So kind of where I wanna go with this and what Alex is, is talking about and explaining really well is this is going back to this idea of, of cryptocurrency and blockchain not necessarily being as inseparable as people want to make them when they say oh we, we can use this blockchain but not, not Bitcoin necessarily all these miners are acting together and doing these really hard cryptographic problems to verify that everybody's being truthful um, in a way that doesn't require an intermediary but what this means is no one person can change what the truth is on the blockchain. I mean, one miner can, but when you add a new block on top, you have the idea of decentralization. You have a lot of different miners all with a vested interest in maybe Bitcoin, for example, working to, to mine these problems. If you have one company that controls all of the miners, there's really no point in a blockchain because they can change the history that's in the blockchain at any time they want. They have enough control over the network to change history at any time. And so if you're one central company that's just using a blockchain because it's like trendy and you can put whatever on there, you, all you really have is a slow and expensive database. 
What makes blockchains, or really the application of blockchain so special, is you have many, many different people acting in this decentralized way, and they, they can all work together because the blockchain helps establish what the truth is. So you can only change history on Bitcoin, for example, if you have enough processing power to out-compute the rest of the network at one time. Right, so I'm just curious, you seem like you may have some thoughts on it, so. I don't know if I'm explaining it in the best way, but does that answer your question? Yeah. You're using the stock analogy. If yeah. I want to trade stock with you, yes. you and I, yes. how can I use the blockchain as the intermediary to facilitate that process and removing that third party. Okay, so the, is, is that clear? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, it's like the decentralized finance. It's happening on Ethereum right now. Um, you Maybe could, I have. We should be talking about the Ethereum blockchain, the yeah. smart contracts, yeah. and that sort of thing. Is that well, smart contracts do play into this. Um, so like I, I say, like every Bitcoin transaction is a smart contract because it can only execute one way, right? It's, it only executes the way it's supposed to be written in the, in the transaction. But for that transaction to execute, for you and I to peer-to-peer -peer trade stock like you're, you're talking about, the miner is not an intermediary in the way that your stock broker is an intermediary, but we would still be relying on the miner to enforce the rules of the network that would allow for a stock trade to take place. So smart contracts are software built on top of cryptocurrency that isn't necessarily requiring it except for like to pay a transaction fee, the same way when you send a, a Bitcoin transaction. But the logic in that transaction is to do the stock trade instead of doing a token trade, right? So smart contracts are the platforms that are being built on top of cryptocurrency to facilitate these applications. But without the mining, which I think is what Josh was expl explaining, without the miners on the network actually enforcing or being incentivized by the cryptocurrency to provide that security for the network, you don't get that layer. And that's where the private blockchain comes in. You don't have any miners on a private blockchain, so you're still relying like the private blockchain would be like you calling your broker. And that broker would be the only miner for that blockchain. And if they wanted to rewind history and replay it a different way, they could do that. And that's not the guarantee or the promise of sovereignty that you're getting with the cryptocurrency. And so you, should, you can think of it like the promises people are selling you with blockchain are actually coming out as smart contracts, is what most people think. So to build on what he's saying, kind of didn't get to in my explanations when I said that like there's a system of economic incentives around cryptocurrencies and blockchain that's really important. If you have a private blockchain that only one company controls, they just do all the work, right? They can replay history at any time, like he said, because they have sole control of the network. When you have a decentralized blockchain that like these cryptocurrencies use, you have many people working on this, right? But here's the problem. As much as we'd like to believe it, people don't necessarily just do things out of altruism. They don't necessarily just do things because they think they're cool. Um, what makes Bitcoin and these things work is these miners have to expend an enormous amount of electricity and computing power and specialized hardware to do mining, to do these cryptographic problems. They are rewarded for their work if they solve a block, if they add a new block with both new currency and transaction fees for all the transactions that were processed in that block. If you don't have some kind of currency or token, so like I think kind of what you're saying is we could have a public blockchain that maybe does like land titles and that sort of thing, where people that are just interested in real estate and want to secure this run a, a land node, right? A land miner. But the problem is, is if they're expending a bunch of their electricity to run this thing, they don't get anything for it, your network is really not going to be strong and thrive. So the reason I say that cryptocurrencies and blockchain are more inseparable than people want to make it out to be is without the economy that you get with the cryptocurrency part of it, you don't really get the decentralized blockchain. You kind of have to have some token or something of value that you get for doing the mining that allows this whole system to work. And maybe that makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. So, so are you telling me that there are no other um, besides cryptocurrency, there's not land titles being stored on a blockchain, there's not stocks or home ownership being stored on a blockchain. 
And there's no miners willing to do that because there's no incentive for them to do that. Well, the cryptocurrency is sort of like the unifying thing that everyone has in common. I, I get that. Yeah. But I'm trying to take this conversation away from cryptocurrency. Okay. I'm just trying to focus on blockchain and okay. the things that blockchain can be used for, yes. like storing maybe you know our healthcare care information on the blockchain and, and protecting that and, and 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 taking out. I mean, I read an article recently where it said one hospital would not share if a patient went into a hospital and had all these work and tests done. Yeah. They wouldn't share that with the other hospital. How will blockchain fix that? I'm asking you. It won't. <laughs> 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 My answer is it won't. It won't. If you just lay blockchain down on top of that, you still have all the old problems. Then we're being misled. By you them. are by the people selling the blockchain, yeah. Yeah, we're being misled. <laughs> I thought we need to have smart contracts involved, of course. But this, the, the blockchain is a ledger, and it's and and. No, it's not. It's more of a strategy. It really is. Um, like the, the real key phrase is miners order transactions. And then blockchain is more like an operation performed on that data. So like if you took all like every transaction and let's say it's ones and zeros and you converted those ones and zeros into a number. And then you went through this math formula where you just started adding those numbers together in little tiny pairs. That's really all blockchain does. And then it comes to a, a, a final answer. And that final answer is shared with everyone else that's mining. And then those miners do the exact same work, and they're just checking to make sure they get to the same answer. That's all blockchain is doing. Well, I, I, yeah. I kind of get that. Yeah. There's ones and zeros. Yeah. But, yeah. but what I'm saying, I thought those ones, ones and zeros are interpreted into um, real life things, or real life. Like actual data. Yeah. So there's something yeah. you can read. Yeah. There's kind of like two separate yeah, things. You're, you're turning me upside down. <laughs> Sorry. Well, well, Alex is right, but I'm going to clarify. Alex is right. Clarify. Is that what you said? Alex is right, but I'm going to clarify this. Yeah. Okay, there are, there are a ton of people that, okay, it's a brand new space. It's exciting, right? There are a ton of people that are just honestly selling bullshit. Um, but here's here I'm gonna, I want to try to explain to you how to discern what is a valuable application of a blockchain and even and even a private blockchain potentially. But you in what like is a not a ledger blockchain is that what you're so saying? So there's actually a suite of different types of blockchain products that no, the IBM hasn't figured out yet. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you, but what do you mean by private? So a private blockchain is, is Ethereum a private blockchain? No, now? Ethereum is a public blockchain. It's a public. So, so two, can look on two it, right? separate parts yeah. of your question. I'm going to address the, the the first one is kind of what right. I was leading into. Right. You're talking about healthcare, right? Here's okay. here's one potential where where a private blockchain. I don't define what that is. Could actually be useful in, in some sense. A private blockchain is a blockchain where only one entity controls the chain and doesn't allow other people to have access to it. You kind of have to have that by definition with maybe a healthcare blockchain because of HIPAA, right? I, I, I don't want, you can't have my private medical records about whatever diagnoses that I have out on a public blockchain. So maybe you're talking about a hospital that has a blockchain to prevent tampering. Well, well what that means is when, when it comes to discerning whether or not this is a valuable use case of the blockchain is you have to remember the whole point of a blockchain is it's immutable. You can't change history without doing a ton of work, right? It's, it's immutable. On a public chain. On a public chain. Yeah. So where it gets kind of interesting with a private application like a healthcare thing is you have to ask, who do I want to not be able to change this data? So with a, with a healthcare database, where, with a healthcare database stored on a blockchain, where it could get kind of interesting is Ultimately, the, the healthcare system, right? Let's say this is Allegheny Health Network's health data blockchain. They could all have their IT people conspire and completely change the healthcare history because only one party controls the data. But maybe if you're doing something like a blockchain, you make it much harder for, say, a nurse or a doctor who's afraid of a malpractice suit because they realize they did something wrong. An individual on that network to change the data without conspiring with other people. But again, that's that's asking and it's sort of answering the question of who am I preventing from from modifying this data, from muting, mutating this data? 
Now, when you're talking about assets like healthcare records and that sort of thing, again, we're saying you, this has to exist on a blockchain that has some incentive to keep the chain going and, and have this economy around it. There is a concept of tokenizing real world assets on blockchains. Right, there's a concept like with Digibyte, with Ethereum, of creating tokens that exist that are tradable on the Ethereum blockchain that maybe represent a real world object, represent some gold, represent something like that. Um, is, that is that what you were going to say? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, like, even like stable coins, like PAX or whatever, like you send dollars and then you have now a, like, an Ethereum token that is now just PAX, it's, it, but it's equal to $1, but it's really a token, and then you sell it and you get your dollars back. So what we're saying is, to really answer your question succinctly, if somebody's telling you that their company is going to create a public land title blockchain and there's not going to be any token, it's not going to really be public, they're kind of just selling you something. Now, if you're talking about maybe having land titles as a token on a, on a network like Ethereum where there's an underlying currency that people get value from, that sort of thing, that's a more realistic use case. That's I think that's way better than the way I put it. Um, like, I think maybe to help too, like yep. you've got on a traditional application, like we currently know at the bank, you've got software developers, the people who run the servers, the management, the business people, the executives, you've got legislators, you've got people on the outside that all can affect that system in some way. But on the cryptocurrency smart contract, you don't. But in a private blockchain, it's actually almost exactly like your traditional application, where those developers, those system admin, those business people, those legislators can still change that data. So the promise of immutability that you get because miners are in competition to make sure that the data never changes isn't there because that competition is gone because only one entity is running that blockchain. God, that was fun. I, you, I, love, <laughs> I, I could talk to you all day about this stuff, and I love your experience and your your. You've been doing this for a lot longer than I have, like as an engineer, and I think it's really cool getting a couple people in a room that I just like I just wanted to say that. I think it's awesome that like, two people with uh, two people that are both engineers with maybe different perspectives and different bits of experience can kinda vibe together on an answer. And I wanna bring Rebecca in too, because oh, she's been sitting here and Yeah, listening, but so. I mean I'm I'm just listening and trying to understand it too because that's what my understanding of putting anything on the Ethereum network, all the ICOs that came out, all these projects that were, oh, this is gonna be the greatest thing we're gonna put all these records on, they all revolve around a token. And you have to own that token and pay somebody with that token in order to make that smart contract go through. That's, I mean, that's very simplistic compared to what you're talking about, but that's why it's, um, it's fascinating some of the projects that I've seen. I'm in supply chain and like the logistics of, I think it's called uh, Sweetbridge was a project that I was following. I don't, you know, it was a whole thing where it was just all the logistics we're going to be on this Ethereum blockchain using this token. And if you bought the token, you would get a discount for something. And then at some point they burn some of the tokens. I mean, it's still very fuzzy to me. Yeah. Thank you for bringing up the blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. Telling me that the blockchain does not have supply chain information on it from grower to food store? I don't know, but I can tell you that if it's a private blockchain, it does not have the security that a public blockchain has. And the data storage on a blockchain is really not the point. You mean like private blockchain that maybe you and I will start together and and call a supply blockchain? Well, I mean, so I'm, I'm missing something here. Who would trust us? Who would trust us? It was our private there, blockchain. There, isn't there a blockchain out there right now that that uh, follows diamonds from mining all the way to I don't, stores? I don't so know. what we're saying is, is it, to kind of put it in like a paragraph, right? Is who has an interest in it? You have to have a lot of people to have a financial interest to have a decentralized blockchain because there has to be an incentive for the miners to do this thing. So maybe if you're gonna like tokenize something on Ethereum, that has value because actually when you trade an Ethereum token, the actual way the protocol works, when you trade an Ethereum token to another Ethereum address, you pay the underlying transaction fee with the Ethereum cryptocurrency, right? So if we have, if, if we wanna have a bunch of people get together and do a diamond supply chain, blockchain. There has to be a reason for them to do that. If there's no underlying currency, there's no interest for everybody else. And then who has an interest in, in having this blockchain? It's the diamond company, right? Well, if I'm Nestle and I want to have a water supply chain blockchain, I'm totally not going to say I suck that out of some 
you know, Amazon River and like ruined a bunch of people's water supply. There's no, there's no, there's no trust there. It's widely known that Walmart is using IBM. the blockchain, a centralized IBM for blockchain. their food, okay. for some of their food. Right. So explain to me, are they using the, crypt, the same blockchain as cryptocurrency, or is it? What do you mean you don't know? I don't know. I, I don't work for Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to follow all and the projects. protect against fraud maybe for one of the stops in long way like the truck driver dropped a crate of tomatoes but ultimately like if the people within Walmart as the broader organization wanted to conspire and change that because maybe you know they have some uh, you know some shady deal with other tomato corp so you, you're, the, there's no there's no trustlessness in that in so that context does that mean that the IBM blockchain is Centralized yep. or decentralized? Centralized. Centralized. Well, centralized. So Hyperledger is a suite of products, and when it first started out, it was actually a spectrum. It started out from fully private, sort of federated, confederated, and then they had fabric, which also had, had mining in it. And, and so what we're really, the heart of what we're talking about is the security model, which comes from the mining. And so is it, are you trusting a decentralized network of thousands of people around the world who are in competition but in agreement that this data needs to maintain the same? Or are you just trusting an IBM database that is like every other IBM database where IBM controls the infrastructure, they control the software, they control the management, they control the executives, and they control the, ultimately the data that goes in. So that's, that's, yes, it can do what you're saying it does. Yes, IBM can say it's doing that, but it doesn't have the security. Sorry, I just kind of like fire hose. What's your day job? <laughs> I don't have one. <laughs> I've, well, thank you for yeah. the great conversation. I hope we'll everybody can come in to have to, a, to, a beer and a warm hug with us over here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, maybe it's a so little, little for, cheesy, but yeah. that was a great thing. And for coming. And, and, and just a plug for January. Bring yes. a friend, bring a friend. <laughs> yes. R.L. Breyer is going to be oh, our guest speaker. He has been in um, to the whole crypto world and Bitcoin since 2009. He's an Austrian economics expert. Um, he's, he's from Pittsburgh. I am really excited. He's cool from guy. Pittsburgh. <laughs> and yeah, so he's written, he's written two books. Two books. And they've been translated into 40 different languages. If I, maybe, maybe I'm exaggerating, maybe 30, but that's still a lot. But yeah, so January is going to be a lot of fun. And in February, we have another Pittsburgh person yeah. on, on lined up. So. RL is a cool and interesting guy. RL is a yeah. very cool and interesting guy. <laughs> I like he's I'm really very, very passionate about this space. And I, I love that. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh